Hello and good morning. Thank you all very much for coming in. Welcome. Um, this morning we have we're going to discuss effectively the next phase of disruption in the VC space. I have four esteemed discussants here. I have four areas that I would like to explore with them, and I have 25 minutes to do it in. In the next, <laughs> in the next 25 minutes, I would like to talk about the uh, VC hubs. Uh, from Saudi Arabia to Europe to the US. I'd also like to talk about cross-border uh, <coughs> investments in the VC space, of course. We'll talk a little bit about sectorial focus and perhaps deep tech as well, which is taking a lot of attention at the moment. And finally, we'll talk about new investment patterns in the VC that are emerging in VC. Effectively, in Saudi Arabia, this is, let's start here, let's start where we are, really. Um, venture capital landscape has significantly evolved in the last five years. And um, in the first half of this year, Saudi Arabia uh, managed to attract $412 million of funding in the first half. That is about 30% of all the funding that um, MENA, the MENA region, had seen, and also that is more than half of the transactions that took place in the MENA region. So, Nabi, let me start and ask you this. Could you shed some light on this for us? Could you tell us what is it that is driving this um, uh, rapid growth in venture capital in Saudi? Sure, thank you. Uh, I, I think many uh, activities have evolved, actually. Uh, I've been part of this ecosystem building in Saudi Arabia since 2010. Yeah. And it all trickles down to, uh, I would say, Vision 2030. Since the launch of Vision 2030, it was very clear how important backing startups and SMEs uh, for job creation, developmental um, metrics and impact, and also for uh, commercial value. Um, and I witnessed where almost like, um, almost zero actually investments in the tech scene here <laughs> since 2010. Uh, if we compared 2018 um, to 2023, it was only $60 million of deployed capital 2018, reached $1.4 billion 2023. Mm. And that's almost 21x or 21 multiple, actually, in terms of the, of the total amount deployed backing uh, venture-backed companies in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia used to be number four across the MENA region. Mm. Uh, and then we reached being number one, 2023. Uh, I think the uh, economic transformation and the social change happening in Saudi is really unlocking the potential for entrepreneurs um, and amazing entrepreneurs actually launching companies that are aspiring to be do, to being regional. And, and what and are you at SVC doing? What sure. is your role? And what, how sure. are you participating in sure. this growth? We started 2018. The mandate was how can we stimulate venture investment? We followed actually global working models in different countries that we learned from, the, like the Korean venture investment arm, the British Business Bank, the Patient Capital, European Investment Fund, uh, which is mainly is the fund of fund model. Mm. So our fund size is now three billion dollars um, until 20, 2030. We commit almost 300 uh, million dollars annually. The 80% we are a fund of funds, but also we do 20% for direct investment and co-investment activities. That complements actually what uh, we have been doing. Hmm. Uh, another very important observation that happened in the ecosystem is two venture-backed companies being listed in the public market. Uh -huh. The exit scene also have been enhancing and improving. I would say almost 100 plus uh, M&A activities and and. and and listing activities happen when for venture-backed companies across the MENA region. And that's actually attracting also top-tier investors coming to Saudi to invest more, where we witnessed Wellington, Sequoia, Jordan Atlantic, TPG, uh, doing more uh, investments now in Saudi and across the MENA region. Oh, interesting. Sam, do you think the next unicorn in VC could come from this region? Uh, sure, it certainly could. From uh, Saudi? I mean, I think... Um, Certainly, people like Dr. Nabil and the other programs here are supporting entrepreneurs tremendously. Um, I mean, Saudi is so interesting because it's m many of the unicorns from MENA have actually come from some of the smallest markets. Obviously, lots of software companies from Israel, for example, where they're building something and then 
um, and, and then shipping it out to markets elsewhere. And Saudi uh, has the promise of being uh, a, a, a country with enough people to build and scale a business domestically, as well as this tremendous top-down support. And a lot of industries, by the way, um, where because of their ability to mandate things uh, and, and act quickly, um, I think you're going to see opportunities where regula the regulatory environment in other countries um, is really stifling innovation, where Saudi has an opportunity to start from, uh, from whole cloth in a lot of ways and, and really support mm -hmm. entrepreneurs financially and from a regulatory basis. So. Tony, um, do you think, or to what extent, in fact, do, does uh, geopolitical uncertainty hinder investment into the region? I mean, look, I, I think, you know, as venture capitalists, um, you know, we're not macro investors and so you know we're obviously you know conscious in a, from a responsibility perspective as fiduciaries of kind of what's happening in the macro environment but you know i think the levels of innovation we've seen you know at, at the earliest stages um you know our time horizon is you know usually a decade out and so you know we don't spend as much time focusing on the the macro as we do on sort of the fundamental technologies and you know sort of the entrepreneurship part and I think, look, we've seen cycles of this, you know, over decades, right? There's been lots of potential, but it's, we're really encouraged by what we're seeing in the region here, uh, in MENA overall, and I think in particular, you know, as Dr. Nabil said, what's, what's happening in Saudi, I think it's really the conditions, you know, we've seen this in the U.S., I mean, you know, frankly, as, as the last two decades have evolved, like the world is flat as it relates to entrepreneurship, technology development, distribution, capital flowing, and uh, in the U.S., it's gotten much more distributed, you know, as New York has emerged on the East Coast uh, and other pockets in, in Texas and Chicago and Boston and Seattle. And we're kind of seeing the, feeling the same conditions here in Saudi. You've got, you know, a real deep alignment, you know, with, with the government and um, with His Excellency's initiatives. I think that the, the spirit of the entrepreneur is alive and well here in the, mm -hmm. in the youthful population. Uh, you know, I think there's a really deep consumer market and there's capital. And I think as, as Dr. Beal said, you know, when you start to see success, you know, that, that in the ecosystem as they've started here already, early signs that kind of builds on itself. And, uh, you know, and I think you know, at the end of the day, you know, AI in particular is going to represent a really unique opportunity for Saudi, uh, you know, in the kingdom to, um, to start to sort of play from a global perspective. Klaus, as these markets mature, as they are in the process of maturing, what, in general, what are the risks that VCs assess when looking at less mature markets? So, <clears throat> look, um, before I answer this, I, it's interesting that you are saying you are not looking at um, macro. I think macro in Europe has, um, is now the, the decisive tipping point. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so we spend probably like 20 years building the ecosystem, and it's actually way bigger than everybody thinks. That and the main reason for that is that we are unbelievably bad in marketing ourselves. Yeah, so you, we have more like 300 unicorns from 120 cities in Europe. Yeah. But since it's not concentrated, um, the, the unified marketing message is in Nirvana, so to say. So why I'm saying that it is a tipping point? <clears throat> because the quality of the entrepreneur has shifted. They now come from technical universities. So, for example, the um, European SpaceX is formed out of a team that won all the Hyperloop competitions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and what happens now is that um, a lot is a, a special um, program, so to say, because suddenly the defense ministries need to um, buy technology for a variety of reasons. Uh. So, first, there's an external macro necessity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and secondly, you have this asymmetry between <clears throat> you cannot scale or buy old equipment mm -hmm. and you have to buy technology. And to give you an idea of a scale, if European defense, NATO member states would stick to 2% of GDP in defense and 5% of that would be technology, that would add up to 50 billion demand, we did not have two years back. Mm. But the saying is probably more that we go to 3.5% GDP and 10% technology, then we are talking 150 to 200 billion extra demand. At a three times revenue multiple, we are talking 500, 600 billion 
market cap for the next 10 years. So this is macro, this is a very special situation, and <clears throat> it is not really defense tech, it is deep tech with suddenly the states having a necessity to be in customer. But what are the complexities in when we start looking at multiple states working together, 24 states within the NATO? You manage the NATO Innovation Fund. How has that played out in the past and how will it play out in the future? <clears throat> so the NATO Fund was basically, the idea was born in uh, July two years back and we were live by um, last year, something like August, September. From then on, yeah, there has been the ministries of defense have committed one billion um, something. And <clears throat> so you buy technologies that enhance the defense capacity of NATO. So this is one purpose. The main purpose, what we really wanted to do is start a discussion, right? Because um, people don't know how poor the situation is, that uh, most of the European countries have ammunition for three days and other facts that uh, are really interesting to say the least. Yeah. <clears throat> but um, so we do have, in order to change that in, in democracies, you have to create an awareness. Yeah? And you have to understand that these kind of, um, the, the rules need to be changed because the ESG taxonomy largely prevents a lot of capital pools from investing into defense technologies. Um, let's talk a little bit about, um, you mentioned deep tech, let's talk about sectorial focus and how important that is. Uh, Nabil, is it time for Saudi to have more sectorial focus? I have to say though, uh, what we had seen um, recently, FinTech had tripled, uh, triple digit growth, I should say, mm -hmm. um, in funding. Um, is, is Saudi going, really deep into sure. one sector, or are we still uh, looking to see Yes, uh, if, if I may also, solution. I want to talk what uh, Sam was mentioning, and you were asking about the, also the unicorn. So last year we witnessed the first two Saudi unicorns. The one is homegrown companies, which is Tamara, for the buy now and pay later model. And we witnessed also a regional company moving their headquarters to Saudi, which is uh, 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 Tabi. Tabby. So mm -hmm. I think that's actually also an indicator how healthy is the ecosystem and evolving and definitely will have more unicorns, but already happening. I just yes. want to highlight that. Another observation. We're going to have uh, a unicorn traffic jam in this case. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Getting there. Uh, but uh, back to your question, which is actually related to the deep tech. Uh, definitely, we monitor actually how markets actually being moving from a nascent market to a emerging market, how the involvement. Usually, it's sector agnostic and state agnostic. Mm. And this move happened. Uh, you cannot enforce specific sectors because the, you need to have enough pipeline of qu uh, quality deals to be invested. And then you can see more sector-focused uh, funds. So when we started, actually, we were, we were stage agnostic, st sector agnostic, when we back fund managers emerging local and regional fund managers, but also in attracting international investors to invest in Saudi. Definitely, after this, after this phase, actually, that during the last five years, I think, I believe the time is prime to do more sector-focused investments. Mm -hmm. uh, we have now a special program in partnership with NTDP, uh, focusing on, on backing deep tech also uh, uh, funds, or funds that have a portion of our allocation to invest in, in deep technology. And another important observation is actually uh, that we already started backing sector-focused funds. So we started uh, backing a fintech company, uh, sorry, a fintech-focused fund actually last year, and also a health tech-focused uh, uh, fund. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the natural progression. It is happening, but I think the time is prime to do more and more when it comes to deep tech. Mm. Uh, Tony, let me ask you, are we uh, risking really choking other uh, sectors, if we keep pouring all the money into, into AI, into infrastructure, into application, everything is AI these days. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Look, I mean, I, th I think, um, you know, we've seen this dynamic before. I think certainly that the, the, the word AI and, and the topic is, is hot today. But I mean, this has been going on for, for those of us who have been investing for a while, this has been going on for a long time. Um, and I think that, you know, we're, we're, we're you know, still sort of really early in the cycle, in our opinion, on this. Um, 
And I think you know, you've got to differentiate between AI native companies and, and AI enabled. And I think there's, you know, for a lot of us, there's a really equally big opportunity in uh, traditional companies uh, that, that we've either funded in our portfolio or that are using you know, AI to kind of really accelerate revenue or you know, sales efficiency and all the other things that, that matter. And there's a much bigger market in the enterprise category for you know, companies that, that are mm. you know, going to need those, those tools, that software to sort of help AI enable their businesses. So we think there's a long tail of opportunity. Um, there's certainly you know, always risk uh, you know, as capital flows into to opportunities that you, know, you can create those dynamics. But you know, we're pretty encouraged um, by the fundamentals that, that we're seeing. Sam, um, these models are going to need a lot of data and a lot of power. Mm. Um, what kind of businesses do we, do we need to be supporting and what are you looking at yeah. today? Uh, I mean, this? As, a, as a relatively early stage investor and, and relatively small uh, fund franchise yes. compared to the, the, the big ones that are able to provide the sort of capital required to, um, to these foundational models, and, and I think it's an increasing question of whether VCs can be doing that at all anymore or whether the, the, just the capital requirements are so extreme, we're seeing where the consolidation is happening there. I think the opportunities for early stage investors and venture investors generally are, are much more in those, in those picks and shovel businesses around data, yeah. and, and I think, um, it, you know, quality data is going to be so important. I mean, we heard it said by, by Peter a bunch of times yesterday and others during the AI panels, like w how these models are going to be trained, where they're going to get their data from, um, what, you know, whether that is uh, from the perspective of regionally appropriate data, culturally significant data. Um, I mean, the power, f that's a whole other area of, of opportunities in terms of are there are there companies that are going to manufacture more power-efficient chips? Are there ways to, to both feed these models and power them um, in, in more efficient manner? Uh, and and, and um, I think that's a, a huge area of focus and something that we need to be paying yeah. a lot of attention to. Yeah. Tony, um, everything is, is about speed in this industry with the technology and AI. Yeah. Everything is moving a lot faster. So how different is VC today from what it was like five or ten years well, ago? Well, I mean, I, I think perhaps somebody said uh, you know, earlier, like the, the, fa the founders are more technical, I think, mm -hmm. in, this, in this part of the cycle. I mean, we're seeing you know, a lot of really great founders come out of you know, the research-intensive universities and... Um, so I think you know the, at the earliest stages of company formation, we've seen that trend. Certainly, um, the pace of you know growth is also in, 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 in certain categories in and around AI is, is like something we haven't seen really before. So I think the pace of company building, the challenges required mm -hmm. to think about scaling, uh, even if you're you know in, in um, certain if you're not in the, the infrastructure side, you still the capital requirements for scaling as many of these businesses is significant. Yeah. Uh, and so I think the complexities coming in to a business that's got product market fit, but is growing that rapidly today are, are much, much more challenging uh, than ever. And so I think it takes, you know, a, um, you know, a lot of resources and scale. And so, Nabil, how is the persona of the founder changing? Oh, I think it's, uh, I can see that uh, Definitely, since uh, I've been part of the ecosystem building, uh, I'm seeing new creatures, actually. New? <laughs> creatures. Okay. So uh, w one is actually, they have been thinking, building uh, a global company as a local company. That's very important for VCs, actually, uh -huh. when they buy. So their focus is more outward than just, uh, or their ambitions. Exactly. Are... And especially in the MENA region and across many emerging markets, I think it's very important that you build a company that has the potential to grow at least regionally, if not globally, uh, to attract also the investors and the backers of these companies and to make decent returns, actually, when there, is, uh, there are exits. Um, I want to highlight also uh, regarding the, the AI investment. We are so proud, actually, backing Antelmatics, yes. which is um, Saudi-based, actually, uh, AI-based. Uh, I always distinguish between AI based versus AI enabled. Yes. I think AI enabled companies, all companies are AI enabled now by default. It's a very uh, important distinction. Exactly. Or if they're not, they'll be out of business. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Short amount of time. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. But I'm, uh, anyway, we have been having discussions over the last uh, few days actually how yeah. we can also work together helping um, 
global companies to expand Saudi Arabia. Speaking of founders, and as there are no women on this panel, I thought I would bring up their case. It seems in data from the US, less than 2% of funding goes to fe female founders, mm -hmm. yet they seem to have twice the returns. Why do female founders not get as much from Klaus? From, oh. uh, <clears throat> I would be happy to fund them. Yeah, so I don't think there is a bias to fund them or not fund them. I think it is um, a very normal process with us. We do have at the beginning of the funnel as much female as male founders. And yeah, through the funnel, yeah, there is the normal process that is uh, pretty mm -hmm. standard. And at the end, if um, <clears throat> we, we do back the quality uh, and there is a, a rigorous process, Mm. Um, which we do, uh, which we, we which we have to do, as as we have to earn money for our LPs, yeah, and this is what 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 is the function. So I do, however, think that in the next iteration, as everything in an ecosystem, it develops. So I mean, when does an ecosystem become better? So if the second generation of entrepreneurs comes that have done it, that have the uh, connections to the uh, uh, to the um, in investors. Yeah, which have the investment uh, connections to the people that have already been built up sales organization. And there you see that uh, a lot is accelerating yeah. also of those female founders that have done it once. Yeah. So they are basically accelerating faster and they obviously yeah. then over index on, on female co-founders. Yeah. Did you want to say something, Sam? No, no? fine. Okay, you're fine. Um, time goes very quickly on those uh, stages. We have an, um, one and a half minutes. I wanted to ask you one question, and I'd like an answer from each one of you, please. When, not if, this panel takes place uh, 10 years from today, uh, what's it going to look like? What are we going to be discussing? What are the, going to be the main points that are coming up yeah. in VC in 10 years' time? Sure. Uh, I believe we're still scratching the surface when it comes to venture investment. There is a, a lot of room to do more and more. Uh, I, I believe also uh, having this, uh, the ecosystem here uh, going uh, onto a level of global competitiveness, I think that's the, the next move forward. So we will also to do the comparison regionally, but I think now we're going into a global competitive uh, venture environment. We're going to be unicorn watching, aren't we? Sure, exactly. <laughs> so. I mean, I guess I would add we're talking about the, the, the future in AI and, and, and AI-enabled businesses. Um, we should include ourselves as venture investors and say, you know, in 10 years' time, the, the industry of investing is going to look wildly different, not just the companies that we're investing in or the people that we're investing in. And I think we also have to be prepared for um, quite a bit of disruption with respect to what, the, what the, the people and entities that we are going to back look like and what our value prop is going to be to those uh, investment opportunities. Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I, I, think, um, I think we'll look back and be impressed with sort of the impact that a lot of the trends that we're talking about these last couple of days have had on, you know, incumbents and big traditional industries as beneficiaries, as mm -hmm. well as, you know, a lot of like really significant new companies created. Um, and we'll probably look back and realize it was bigger than we than we probably thought. I think the you know we're very uniquely focused. I think aggressively on the intersection of tech and healthcare. I think that in AI is part of that. I think that that it's going to be significant over the next decade, I think we'll look back, there's going to be just rapid innovation and development in the healthcare uh, sector. I think Saudi is going to be a net beneficiary of a lot of the trends we're talking about the last, next, last couple of days. And so I think the ecosystem here will be uh, uh, much bigger. I think that there'll be more activity from the companies you know, coming into the region and then native you know, ecosystem development. Maybe we'll have a bigger portfolio, yeah. uh, as will we and others uh, in the region. And, um, yeah. and so that, that, those are the things that I think will happen. Thank you. Klaus? Yeah, look, I, <clears throat> we will probably be seeing that um, venture is a way bigger asset class because at the end it finance innovation and the half-life time of companies shortens. So <laughs> that means by entertaining a very vivid um, a home economy, you need to quickly produce new uh, companies. And... This will happen in a big variety of fields, and every geo will have its advantages. Yeah, you have the AI predominance in the US, but then you have maybe energy here. You have a lot of, of, of topics that we cannot think about yet. But yes. the, the prevailing thing is that I guess everybody will have accepted that 
in absence of banking financing, venture will be the asset class that finance innovation. Yes. I look, I look forward to seeing that variety in, uh, in the projects that will be financed and in the drivers of the economic growth. Can I have just fun five sure. seconds back to your question about the women participation. I think not only being founders, but also part of the venture scene. Mm -hmm. We're so proud in Saudi Arabia that is, there's a significant contribution of uh, uh, female venture investors yes. from a partner level to analyst. And, yes. and that's the, one of the highest actually uh, percentages when you, if you confer it to other markets globally. Yes, and I felt very privileged to have met a couple of them in the last couple of days. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. Thank, Thank you very you. much for attending. I hope this was uh, useful and I hope that you, ta you take away some things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.